Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Bill Motch. Bill earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry from McGill University, where he carried out undergraduate research on aminium-catalyzed polyene cyclizations in the Gleason group. He subsequently earned his master's degree at the University of South Florida, where he worked on total synthesis in the Del Valle group. Currently, he's a PhD student at Temple University in the group of Professor Sarah Wingrenuk, who was actually previously joined as a speaker herself. And from there, I'll hand it over to you, Bill. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction and for having me here today. Today, I will be discussing the Wengernick Lab's first electrochemistry project, specifically my recent paper in Orglet, where we demonstrated a site-selective synthesis of collodinium salts using electro-oxidative CH functionalization. I hope that by the end of today, viewers will have an appreciation for the art of electrochemistry as an emerging tool for reaction development, as well as an appreciation for the synthetic utility of pyridinium salts. Now let's get into it. Today we will be discussing pyridinium salts. These structures are quite prevalent in many natural products, bioactive pharmaceuticals, and also have applications to material sciences as biodegradable ionic liquids as well as low potential analytes. In terms of synthetic utility, pyridinium salts can serve as a starting point for a variety of transformations. These salts can serve as papyridine precursors, engage in cycloadditions, and undergo various ring contractions and isomerizations. N-aryl pyridinium salts also allow us to synthesize anilines through zinc aminolysis, and N-alkyl pyridinium salts can be used to generate carbon-centered radicals through a variety of deamination methods. Despite their broad applications and synthetic utility, the synthesis of N-alkyl pyridinium salts is typically reliant on two traditional methods. Nucleophilic substitution, which requires forcing conditions and pre-functionalized substrates, or oxopyrillium condensation, which uses expensive reagents and requires the presence of an amine already built into the substrate. In the Wengernick lab, we have an interest in developing new methods of pyridinium salt synthesis using oxidative functionalization strategies. Within our lab, we use both the chemistry of hypervalent iodine as well as electrochemical generation of radical cations so that we may synthesize pyridinium salts directly from olefins and CH bonds. In developing these new methods, we hope to expand the scope of pyridinium salts as heterocycle precursors and enable continued growth and expansion of pyridinium salts as redox active handles. Today, I will be talking about our first electrochemical method, an electrochemical benzylic CH functionalization, which led to products that can be used as redox active functional groups. In thinking about pyridinium salts as redox active functional groups, the 246 triphenyl pyridinium represents the typical starting point for what we refer to as deamination chemistry. These salts can undergo a single electron reduction event, leading to homolytic carbon nitrogen bond cleavage. The resulting carbon centered radical can then react in a variety of ways to form new carbon carbon or carbon heteroatom bonds. The Kutritsky salt is easier to reduce than the analogous NHP ester or alkyl halides. Additionally, the pyridinium moiety allows the molecule to engage in unique modes of activation, making it more than just a pseudohalide. However, there are a few downsides to this powerful chemistry. Oxopyrillium reagent used to synthesize Kutritsky salts is quite expensive, and the salt itself leads to poor atom economy in reactions. In recent years, efforts have been made to expand the scope of pyridiniums that can engage in deamination chemistry. In 2021, a collaboration between the Kozlowski lab and the Watson lab used a combination of synthesis, computation, and electrochemistry to better understand how the precise nature of the pyridinium influences carbon nitrogen bond cleavage. In the same year, the Weber lab used benzylic collodinium salts as radical precursors that could effectively engage in Giza reactions. It was this paper from the Weaver group specifically that really piqued our curiosity and inspired our electrochemistry project. In Weaver's work, primary benzyl halides were treated with the inexpensive collodine freebase to generate benzylic collodinium salts. These are more atom economical than the triphenyl Kotritsky salt 
and the Weaver lab was able to show that these salts engage effectively in the Giza reaction. This work was the first example of collodinium salts being used in chemistry that we typically see reserved to Kotritsky salts. With our lab's growing interest in pyridinium salt synthesis, we wanted to see if we could synthesize similar benzylic collodinium salts directly from CH bonds in the hopes of complementing the work done by Weaver. We sought to bypass the forcing conditions typically required in substitution chemistry, and we were hopeful that a CH functionalization strategy would allow us to access secondary benzylic collodinium salts as these were substrates that the Weaver lab were not able to access. As we began to approach designing our benzylic collodination reaction, our first thought was that we may be able to use airing radical cations. Oxidation of an electron-rich anisole derivative can generate a radical cation intermediate which can undergo two different reaction pathways. The first pathway happens when a pyridine is able to attack an electrophilic site on the radical cation ring, followed by an oxidation and deprotonation sequence to generate an n aryl pyridinium salt. The second pathway occurs when deprotonation at the benzylic position happens first. This deprotonation is incredibly facile as the adjacent radical cation renders the CH bond incredibly acidic. After this rapid deprotonation and another oxidation, a quinone methide intermediate is formed and pyridine can then add in at the benzylic position and regenerate the aromatic ring, giving us our N-benzyl pyridinium salt. We were aware of reports from the Kochi group in the late 80s that showed that pyridine derivatives with differing nucleophilicities and basicities will lead to different ratios of n aryl and N-benzyl pyridinium salts. Also, the Yoshida lab had previously used anodic oxidation in their work to synthesize n aryl pyridinium salts. In one paper, they gave a single example where they observed a mix of n aryl and N-benzyl pyridinium salt products. There was poor selectivity, and the result was not pursued further by their lab. Based off of what we knew from the Kochi group, as well as the previous success the Yoshida group had using electrochemistry to synthesize pyridinium salts, we hypothesized that if we took Yoshida's conditions and used collodine instead of pyridine, then we would synthesize N-benzyl collodinium salts exclusively. Using an electrocin, we set up Yoshida's reaction using collodine instead of pyridine. We were delighted to find that we generated N-benzyl collodinium salt in good yields with no n aryl products detected. However, there was a small problem with this result. The N-benzyl collodinium salt was essentially impossible to separate from the tetrabutyl ammonium electrolyte, and the divided cell setup only allowed the reaction to achieve 3 milliamps of current leading to prolonged reaction times. We were aware of a previous paper from the Stahl lab where protonated lutidine had been used as an electrolyte in electrochemical benzylic iodination chemistry. We hypothesized that we could use protonated collodine as an electrolyte and at the end of the reaction perform a base wash and ether trituration to purify our desired product. To our delight, using protonated collodine as electrolyte worked very well. We were also able to switch to an undivided cell and increase the current to 15 milliamps, making our reactions finish much quicker than in a divided cell setup. We initially started with collodinium perchlorate, but switched to collodinium tetrafluoroborate to avoid the hazards of working with perchlorates and so that our resulting collodinium salts would have the tetrafluoroborate anion, which is the typical anion in Kitritsky salt literature. Using collodinium tetrafluoroborate as electrolyte gave excellent yields. Unfortunately, lowering the concentration of electrolyte saw a decrease in yields. However, we were able to recycle the collodine at the end of reactions, and we found that reusing it in a precaution-free setup with solvent from a benchtop squirt bottle provided product in comparable yields to our optimized conditions. I've spoken to numerous people who are hesitant about bringing electrochemistry into their labs and research. However, the electrocin from ICA makes setting up electrochemical reactions incredibly accessible. So I've included a video of me setting up an electrochemical collodination to show just how easy it is. Here's me adding the solid electrolyte to a vial containing the substrate and collodine freebase. There I'm adding acetonitrile. 
Now I'm turning on the stir plate to make sure that the electrolyte is completely dissolved. Now I'm adding the cap with the electrodes onto the vial, attaching the cap to the instrument. And now I'm going through the menu options, telling the instrument to do a constant current reaction, telling it how many milliamps I want, and how many millimoles of substrate are in the vial. And then you hit start, and then the reaction starts. And at the end of the reaction, a simple base wash and ether trituration gives us our product as a free-flowing solid collodinium salt without the need for any sort of chromatography. With an optimized reaction in hand, we then set about doing a substrate scope. We added various electron donating and withdrawing groups to the ring and found that we still got site-selective benzylic collodination in good yield, even in substrates where we might have CH bonds that could also be oxidized in the case of the amide. We then wanted to see what would happen if our molecule had multiple benzylic CH bonds. We found that even with multiple benzylic positions, Collodination occurred exclusively at the benzylic position that was para to the methoxy group. We also saw that if we had an allyl substituent, we would see isomerization that would give us a styrene product. Having pendant alcohol substituents led to lower yields, but we found that acylating the alcohol brought this yield back up, and electron deficient enones were also able to be used in the reaction without being reduced. In the presence of leaving groups like tosylated alcohols and alkyl chlorides, we saw only benzylic collodination with no competitive SN2 type reactions. An anisole derivative containing a Bach protected phenylalanine, which has another benzylic position and oxidizable CH bonds, gave only one collodinium product. We even found the reaction to be successful on nitrogen containing heterocycles as exampled by the methoxypyridine derivative. We tested various modifications to the methoxy group and found that the reaction was successful with TBS protected alcohols as well as benzyl protected alcohols. However, alkylated alcohols with a pendant olefin were somewhat unsuccessful. We were quite pleased that this method could successfully form secondary benzylic collodinium salts with yields increasing as steric hindrance increased about the beta hydrogen. This likely prevents competitive elimination pathways, which we observed as a byproduct in the crude NMRs of these reactions. We then explored what other heterocycles would lead to benzylic functionalization. And we found that as long as we had two substituted pyridine derivatives, we saw no n aryl pyridinium salts. We generated the n benzyl pyridinium salts exclusively. We were even able to electrochemically synthesize a benzylic Petritsky salt with slight modifications to the conditions due to the low solubility of the 246 triphenyl pyridine. As for unsuccessful substrates, we found that molecules with high oxidation potentials were unsuccessful. Increasing steric hindrance also led to unsuccessful reactions. Finally, we were able to show that electrochemically synthesized collodinium salts were compatible with the chemistry developed by the Weaver group. We hope that demonstrating new methods for the synthesis of pyridinium salts will inspire other lab groups to develop more ways to utilize these molecules in novel transformations. In conclusion, we have developed the first synthesis of N-alkyl pyridinium salts via a net CH functionalization, providing a complementary approach to traditional substitution and condensation reactions of pre-functionalized substrates. This reaction proceeds under mild conditions with complete site selectivity, uses an inexpensive and recoverable collodine electrolyte system, and does not require chromatography to isolate the products. The broad scope includes both primary and secondary collodinium salts, the latter being effectively inaccessible via traditional nucleophilic substitution. The resulting collodinium salts represent an emerging scaffold for SET-mediated pyridinium cross-couplings, 
offering improved atom economy, cost, and versatility in synthesis over the established Kotritsky salts. Future studies in our lab aim to extend this platform to include a broader scope of heterocycles, explore conditions that are compatible with less electron-rich aromatic rings lacking a methoxy group, and develop general oxidative strategies to functionalize various CH bonds. With that, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Sarah Wengrenek. Neither of us had ever done any sort of electrosynthesis before this project, so it felt like a big decision at the time when we decided to do this work. And while there were definitely moments of stress and self-doubt, especially at the beginning of the project, I'm very glad we did it because I learned a completely new skill that I never thought I would when I was applying to grad school. And I think that's what the PhD journey is all about. So thank you, Sarah, for all the guidance and support in making sure I did not give up and teaching me to trust the process and trust the chemistry. I also have to thank the W Lab members, past and present, who were always there to support me and bounce ideas around in lab and during group meetings. And of course, thank you, Matt, for giving me the platform to discuss this work. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Bill for joining to share your work with us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.